Ja, herzlich willkommen, liebe Teilnehmer in Deutschland und wo auch immer in der Welt. Very warm welcome to all of you, dear participants in Germany and elsewhere in the world, who will profit from biodiversity is the question. And I would like to apologize. We had minor technical problems before we could start this webinar, but now we've solved these problems and I'm very happy to welcome you. I'm Christiane Grafer. I'm a journalist focusing on globalization, agriculture, and ecology. And I am honored and pleased to host the webinar today. This is an event hosted and organized by Heinrich Böll Foundation, Bread for the World, and FDC. L, the Research and Documentation Center, Latin America. There will be simultaneous interpreting German, English, and Spanish. And you have on your screen little buttons so you can choose the language you want to hear. Today, we will talk about new questions concerning the property of the global genome. Globalization has created unprecedented opportunities with respect to the usage of the genetic material, but also with the digital sequence information. The DSI. So instead of using the code, DSI is used. And experts tell us that those who use the genome, be it researchers, be it others, are to be found in the north of the world, whereas those who provide it are to be found in the south. We have eminent guests here today who will talk about this topic. It's an important topic also in terms of global justice. I'm happy to welcome Edward Hammond. He's a director, a, an expert for biotechnology from the United States. And I'm happy to welcome Alejandro Argomedo. He is with the Swift Foundation in Peru. And Dr. Hartmut Meyer, he is a team leader of the ABS initiative of the GIZ. I'm happy to have you all here. You can't see them yet, but they are around, no doubt. Just a bit of information concerning this event and the procedure. For those of you who are with us for the first time today, this is the third sequel of a series of programs focusing on nature and the battle for nature. This is, so to speak, a preparation for the biodiversity conference, a global conference to be held sometime next year. Now, we would like to talk about international, the international protection of species, which is an aspect that has so far not been in the focus of the international debate. We had eminent experts from the federal ministry and the um, general secretariat of the biodiversity convention. And we've talked about what to expect prior to the upcoming COP. And we have also looked at the broad range of aspects that have been brought up in those difficult times, because we are all marked by the COVID pandemic. In the second round, we've talked about possibilities to do something about pests and diseases. GMO is allegedly a solution here, but there are major risks for human beings. And today we will talk about genome editing and DSI. And the idea is to, first of all, have our experts 
give their presentations and talk among themselves. And afterwards, i.e. after 45 minutes or so, you will also get an opportunity to take the floor. And you can also send us your questions already during the talk. There is a Q&A tool we have made available to you. You see it on your screens. The Q&A tool is different from the chat. The chat is meant to be a means for you to talk among each other and we will also make additional information available in the chat. So if you have questions or if you want to comment, use the Q&A tool. And in terms of conclusion, let me also tell you that we've prepared a questionnaire with a number of questions <clears throat> for you a little survey of Paul, and we would like to ask you to answer those questions in the next 50 minutes so that we get a better idea of who is participating. We would like to know whether you are experts, scientists, scholars representing an NGO. So if you could take the time and answer our questions, we'd be extremely pleased. Now that's all in terms of an introduction. And I would like to start and invite Edward Hammond to take the floor. As I've said in the beginning, he's been involved in high tech and biosecurity projects for many years right now. He's the director of Prickly Research in Austin, Texas. And he's also a consultant to the Third World Network, which has been established in 1984 and is the voice of the global South for the WTO, but also for the CBD. They are carrying out research and they are commenting. Now, I said initially that we had a te technical problem and well, we have this problem with Edward Hammond, i.e. we cannot communicate, but he will offer a statement in order to start, off, start us off. He will tell us a bit about DSI. He will tell us what relevance DSI has for biosafety, biosecurity and nature and what we can expect from the CBD COP. Okay. Very good. Edward Hammond, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation, and I apologize for the uh, for the technical difficulties. Uh, my understanding is that is what I need to do now is to is to speak a little bit about what's meant by DSI uh, and what its significance is in the context of biodiversity and and agriculture. So um, the first thing to know is that is that DSI or digital sequence information is a is a new term that was invented by the Biodiversity Convention a few years ago that's intended as a placeholder and has no formal definition. So if you're confused a bit as to what it means, uh, that's okay. No one really precisely knows what its scope is at this moment. Um, uh, in, in, in very simple terms, it refers to genetic sequences. So the DNA and RNA sequences of living things um, as well as the amino acids and proteins, the sort of building blocks and, and assembly, assembled bits uh, of living organisms. Um, and it means some things that go beyond that, which are still under discussion. Um, I think the, the best way to describe its significance is to, is to think about the, or to discuss it in the context of the technological change that, that, that has made it so important. You know, in the, in the traditional model of, of, of benefit sharing, access and benefit sharing under the Biodiversity Convention, uh, which is intended on the benefit sharing side to, to hold up the third pillar of the convention, which is that there is fair and equitable benefit sharing when genetic resources are used. Um, the traditional mode would be that um, bioprospectors or universities or companies would approach holders of genetic resources and there would be a physical transfer of, of a plant or another type of sample from a provider to a user. And that would be accompanied by a material transfer agreement which laid out the terms and conditions of that transfer um, and would establish the legalities and would be an enforceable agreement in theory under law. 
Um, but that mode of, of, of transfer of genetic resources, which will remain in use for many years to come, is being in significant part um, affected and is being replaced in some areas by access to genetic resources, excuse me, through, through the simple uh, act of downloading their sequence from databases. Um, and so, if, yes, uh, hello? Ganz kurze Unterbrechung. Um, sure. Oh, can I explain ich, uh, it? Yes, briefly. I okay, he, yes. he got it. Um, <laughs> access and benefit sharing. So under the Biodiversity Convention, which, which was uh, signed in 1992, uh, the, the pillars of the, well, one of the pillars, the, the notion behind the convention in, in large part is that in order to stimulate conservation of biodiversity and genetic resources, they would, you know, be, uh, their value, there would be benefit sharing uh, related to the value that's generated from their use. So when, um, for example, uh, a, a crop plant, uh, say just in a hypothetical, just in, a, in an example of crop plants such as coffee, which is found in Africa, was used and uh, developed and there was uh, money derived from its use, that in theory, some part of that benefit would, would go back to the farmers that maintain the, the, the crop in the, in the field um, or the genetic diversity of the crop in the field. Um, and the same thing would apply to things like medicinal plants um, or other types of biodiversity that we use, uh, that everyone uses uh, across the world every day. Um, uh, okay, so if I could return, returning to the, to the question of, of, of DSI then, um, the, uh, what's happening now because um, in small organisms such as viruses and bacteria can be wholly synthesized uh, from sequence data, important genes can be synthesized from sequence data, and using artificial intelligence and uh, big data methods uh, gene sequences that are in data banks can be manipulated to produce products. This link between a user going to a provider and signing a, a physical agreement has been broken. And so what we see increasingly is use of genetic resources without the user who may be a company uh, going and executing an agreement that says that, hey, we will, we will share part of the part of the benefits with, with you, the provider. So that, that third pillar of the Biodiversity Convention, which is that when resources are used, there should be fair and equitable sharing of the benefits, is, is in effect undermined by the use of genetic resources that are accessed from gene banks and that are accessed without executing one of these material transfer agreements, which is the traditional way to do things. Ich äh, muss, liebe Teilnehmer, leider meine Fragen hier in den Chat schreiben. Äh, da ist gerade wieder ein kleines technisches Missverständnis. Dear participants, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to write my questions into the chat. There is a small misunderstanding. Is this, uh, is this to me? Yes. Yes. Again, I apologize for the, for the difficulty. Um, what to expect from the CBD? Well, the, um, uh, this issue really came into, uh, into the international policy discussion in 2016 and at the CBD meeting in Mexico. Um, and then it was subsequently discussed two years later in Egypt. And um, the, the question on the table is, of course, um, how do we do benefit sharing for use of genetic sequence data or digital sequence information. Um, what we can expect, we don't know precisely at the moment, but the, uh, I would say that the, that the policy discussions that are ongoing, um, well, the first thing that I would say is that the discussion around digital sequence information and progress on benefit sharing for its use 
has been linked by many developing countries to the adoption of the post-2020 agenda by the CBD. So the, the entire sort of uh, future work of the Biodiversity Convention is in the minds of many developing countries linked to an adequate resolution of the problem of biopiracy that is beginning to happen when there's no benefit sharing for use of, of gene sequences. Um, the, the discussions that are, are ongoing and of course have been thrown into a, a time disarray by the pandemic. So uh, we're not sure when precisely, you know, we'll, we'll be able to advance. Um, I think that um, initially uh, we, uh, the, the developing countries and the civil society organizations that were, that were really sort of champions of this issue, um, we, we initially encountered um, a, a lot of denial and distraction by developed countries um, and, and a sort of uh, unwillingness or reluctance to, to recognize the problem. I think that that reluctance to, to recognize the need for benefit sharing for use of DSI is a problem that's now receded. And certainly Europe, uh, and perhaps to a lesser extent, some of the other developed countries uh, now recognize that, they, that there needs to be a solution here. Um, a second problem that we encountered was that um, there was a uh, substantial uh, concern, I would say, or, or, or um, uh, opposition from areas of the open access community. So the scientific community that is uh, dedicated to the notion of, of uh, unfettered, uh, completely open access to genetic sequence data. And um, this group saw the idea of doing benefit sharing as potentially impairing the, the, the sort of scientific flow, flow of scientific information. Um, but I think that over time, these, these discussions are now sort of leaning in a more positive direction. And I think that the, um, the open access community at least appears at this time to be beginning to understand that, um, that, you, that you can't um, distribute these genetic resources that belong to somebody or that belong to communities uh, and not accept responsibility somehow for how they're used by the end user or not place a responsibility on the end user to do benefit sharing. So I think that there, um, there would appear to be, and, and this is a bit, I'm putting the optimistic case forward. Uh, there would appear to be um, a, uh, an emerging, uh, an emerging, I wouldn't say consensus, but, but a large number of, of people now would agree that we need to have a multilateral system uh, that, would, that would generate benefits that would go into a, into a fund uh, likely, or, or, a, or you know, yeah, a multilateral system of benefit sharing for DSI, and that this would allow, um, this would allow the, the open access databases to continue to operate in a manner more or less like they do today but the users of those databases um, would need to uh, would need to do benefit sharing, and that this benefit sharing would wind up in a in a multilateral fund of some sort. Um, so, uh, and and this is uh, that that's in the context of the biodiversity convention. Um, this is something that has already been discussed in in agriculture as well, and in, in the seed treaty. Um, where in fact there was an effort to, to sort of reform and amplify and make the benefit sharing system for agricultural seeds uh, to improve it. Um, unfortunately, uh, last year that negotiation collapsed because the developed countries really refused to deal with DSI in that discussion. But I think that we, as I was saying, we've come a step forward or two um, um, from there. Uh, and I think at this point, I'm optimistic that we will begin to be discussing a multilateral system uh, for benefit sharing for DSI in the next year or two. Um, and it would be my personal conviction that given the uh, sort of extreme crisis that we see in biodiversity, the failure to achieve any of the major targets that the Biodiversity Convention set for itself, the, the Aichi targets, um, and given that we know, and it's been proven or it's been documented time and time again, that indigenous people and local communities are in general better stewards of genetic resources than 
some of the rest of us that that, that those funds, that that multilateral benefit sharing mechanisms support them. Um, the economic dimension of, of, of DSI, yeah. Um, sure, I think that um, it's, it's, it's tremendous, right? Because although the, the databases are, are open access, meaning that anyone can access this data, um, once it's processed through AIs or you know, proprietary algorithms of one sort or another, uh, you can produce proprietary products and take out patents on sequences and the use of those sequences. So the, the economic implications are huge in, in agriculture um, and in medicine is one area where they're already um, rather apparent. Um, probably, I think, one of the most compelling examples that shows how the economics can work of DSI is, is one of, um, uh, of, a, of a Regeneron, which is a US company, which has an, an Ebola monoclonal antibody. This is the same company that makes the monoclonal antibody that Donald Trump was administered when he came down with COVID. Um, this company also has, a, has an antibody to treat Ebola disease. Um, it, it's a very interesting example because the Ebola virus was taken from West Africa passed through France, went to Germany, and then the sequence of that, day, of that virus was uploaded to a database. Well, rather than obtaining the virus and signing a material transfer agreement, the American company chose to simply download the sequence. And it's obtained a patent on an Ebola treatment that was developed using that sequence, and it's received $400 million from the US government to date. So obviously there are, um, very substantially profitable and, and large, you know, important products that can result from DSI. Um, sure, yeah, how the information is communicated and, and loaded and who does that. It, it, it's going to vary a bit depending upon what type of biodiversity you're, you're speaking of. Um, I think one of the concerns that has not been very well addressed so far, and we don't know how it's gonna play out in the, in the UN discussions um, is, is of course um, everything that has been collected to date. And you can go back to colonial times, to the botanic gardens, to um, everything that was collected by developed countries where the biotech industry or, you know, is based uh, is now sort of fair game to be sequenced. So academics may be doing this sequencing, companies may be obtaining it directly and doing this sequencing. Um, okay, uh, uh, and, uh, and then, then, it, then it, is, it is uploaded. It should be noted also finally that um, uh, there are also proprietary databases. So it's not simply the, the open access stuff, uh, but companies as well will maintain their own data and they can bring those data sets to together in a, in a private atmosphere and facilitate product development. So uh, thank you, and I apologize again for the audio difficulty. Okay, vielen, vielen Dank, Edward. Um, is this Many thanks, Edward. It's the first time that I've uh, been working with using hands and feet as a moderator. We wrote the questions um into the chat because unfortunately he can't hear us and uh, uh, many thanks uh, firstly for the information and um, of course the due to the speedy development in gene type technology um, and the sequence uh, data can uh, be collected much faster so you have a lot more data available that you can use for experimentation so therefore it's quite uh, important and uh, it's good that we have had a general explanation and now if we want to um, be a bit more concrete and talk about uh, an example a case study therefore i would like to welcome um Mr. Alomedo, briefly, he's program director at the SWIFT Foundation. It's a foundation that's dealing with uh, uh, maintaining biodiversity and regional uh, food systems. And um, so he's been working on these topics for 25 years with indigenous people, with uh, various organizations, governments, and UN institutions. So he has a lot of experience. And uh, 
Mr. Algomedo, we would like to hear um, uh, about one case from you, which is about a crop from a region where you live, the potato. Um, so is there a debate about uh, certain potato types that have been changed and um, altered uh, um, with this technology and then distributed in Africa? Please tell us about this concrete example of DSI. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. And thanks for the opportunity to be able to speak here in this panel. I'd like to give you just a little bit of context. Uh, I'm working here with a potato. This is what we're all talking about. And this is where my interest is focused. And uh, this initiative uh, does not only involve, uh, say, uh, 6,000 uh, people of the Inca population, um, mm, where we try to celebrate the diversity of the potato, where it stems from actually, where it has its origins. The diversity in this region is really extraordinary. Uh, in the like park it. itself, in the potato park, we have um, five different uh, varieties, 1,300 varieties is uh, what are matched by the communities and one of the first genetic reserves uh, uh, that is dedicated to the wild potato and uh, our um, uh, people have always used uh, the potato for medicinal uses, so for uh, um, the, um, the betterment of uh, the cultivated areas. So there is a direct connection to the traditional use of uh, the land and uh, the potato. And for thousands of years, uh, we've had an agriculture, 10,000 years our agriculture old already, and we have made use that uh, we have benefited from the potato crop. and. Uh, this very strong and close uh, biocultural connection that we have established. Um, and then uh, beyond uh, the uh, cultural values uh, that uh, the potato has and the social values, uh, we have a very strong uh, economic power and economic uh, significance for our peoples because uh, the potato has of course uh, a local um, it's a local business uh, of uh, seat sewing, and uh, this is very uh, worrying what we see right now because uh, now the DSI is uh, changing the whole situation, and we think that uh, the organisations and other interested stakeholders have found a new uh, found a new way of committing biopiracy, and. Uh, Utilizing the DSI, um, of course, gives them the possibility instead of exceeding directly the plant, uh, um, then we have signed uh, certain agreements, uh, mutual agreements, uh, mutual. and the commercial contracts. Uh, but now the um, yeah, the companies don't have any responsibility really to, to share the benefits and for us and all the other indigenous peoples, I think that uh, this uh, is a form of digital bio, uh, bio piracy. So the DSI really gives way to um, not only take away the seeds and uh, the physical material value, but of course, uh, as well, the cultural and the traditional knowledge. And uh, this uh, traditional knowledge, of course, can be obtained uh, uh, via publications or magazines with the help of anthropologists. And uh, by this, uh, of course, uh, the control can be exerted uh, over those peoples and over those communities. And uh, once we have the information, we can create key genes uh, with the help of DSA instead of firming bind, uh, uh, signing binding agreements uh, where we have to be uh, um, benefiting from a benefit sharing from ABS. Can you uh, give us a concrete 
um, example of the marketing of the potato in East Africa. Yes, of course. I just wanted to give you just a little bit of context to, to fill you in what uh, the value of uh, uh, the uh, uh, the potato. The GM potato is a variety of the Victoria that comes from uh, uh, South America but has been uh, selected for its use in Eastern Africa. Victoria has been developed by the um, International Potato Center, which is headquartered here in Peru. And uh, we have chosen different varieties of the potato plant to be used for crops in other countries. And uh, um, the main problem was um, late blight, which uh, was a long-standing problem. And uh, this uh, problem can usually be taken care of without the use of genetic engineering and without any uh, chemical help. The GM potatoes, so this is something I have to underline because uh, Peru just um, just cancelled the moratorium uh, for GM crops for 15 years, and this has been rejected in many developed markets. So one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves, uh, why um, do we play around with this kind of potato fighting against the late blight? The main objective is simply to generate more income and uh, more benefit for those companies. So uh, those uh, synthetic um, genes uh, can be found uh, in uh, the plant in northern Argentina that uh, has been uh, uploaded to the gene bank, to the data bank in 2010. And uh, the other genes that have been uh, collected before um, 57. Uh, was sequenced and was then uploaded to the gene bank in 2005, both. The English and uh, the uh, Netherlands uh, were claiming the uh, proprietary rights uh, for those uh, genes that uh, they sequenced, but um, the International Potato Center did not say publicly that uh, those GM potatoes um, that was used in East Africa was a product of DSI. The um, three genes uh, from uh, um, the GM manipulated uh, crops uh, uh, did not really prevent from physical origins, but synthesized uh, um, using the sequencing that uh, were obtained from the gene banks. And uh, this is what this case is all about because The, um, the, seed, uh, the, uh, the seeds that were synthesized uh, with the help of the gene bank, uh, uh, with the help of a US American company and Eurofilms, that is a German company, who synthesized uh, uh, with the help of the data uh, obtained from the gene bank. Now, the potato are simply a manifestation of our traditional knowledge of uh, the catcher community in the Andes. And uh, obviously, those were the Indian agriculture um, um, farmers that, uh, uh, yeah, helped grow the potato thousands of years ago. But the most important question in this context, for me personally, is uh, the in the international agreement on um, technicals or the Nagoya Protocol establish uh, how the uh, benefit sharing, the um, equal benefit sharing is managed and how it, uh, the uh, traditional knowledge is involved and the indigenous communities, uh, like I've already said, um, in order to solve this debate and uh, and to the last meeting of the steering committee of the International Treaty failed due to the fact that uh, we were not able to find any consensus. 
In this case, to the gym potatoes led to the fact that uh, we met uh, the uh, smallholders from uh, Peru with other farmers from East Africa in order to um, demand to claim full a higher transparency in order for us to obtain this ABS that we are not victims of a biopiracy in the context of the DSI use. Well, thank you. And there is another small question. The uh, access and benefit sharing regime, so participation in the commercial profits, it uh, assumes that uh, the natural product um, um, has a monetary value. So that means when you demand it, then um, you uh, acknowledge it as a commercial product and not a common ownership of uh, it. And isn't that a conflict for you? Because I seem to recall that there are certain collective rights in South America, um, collective rights to uh, potatoes. Uh, and then uh, so you are entering now a commercial sphere. How do you see it? No, um, mire, los no not really. The indigenous peoples uh, uh, have simply been shown to be the most effective ones in order to maintain their wild biodiversity and the diversity of the different varieties of the crops. And uh, it's always been set thinking that uh, this might be of benefit for the whole community or the whole society in Peru. A civilization was created, a sophisticated uh, society was created, but uh, the, the Incas did not really have any money. The, the objective or the main objective of uh, growing those potatoes was simply to feed their own community. But now we cannot permit that on the basis of our principles, of our principles of um, solidarity, of uh, sharing our goods, somebody else takes advantage and commits biopiracy. We would like to receive support, not only from our national state, but as well from the international community in those times of the coronavirus, uh, where uh, hundreds and thousands of people have suffered from the pandemic that much uh, in the Indian region, where we have a obvious problem of uh, our food sovereignty. And in this society, in this current society, we have to see that uh, our resources and our benefits that should be of benefit to our local communities um, have to be used for the maintaining of the biodiversity that uh, indigenous peoples who are the most effective in conserving the biodiversity that they are the ones who are benefiting because otherwise we would simply continue the colonialism that uh, just never stops. One last brief question, and uh, also I would like to keep your answer short. It's about a just uh, distribution of profits. But are there any other consequences for Peru or other countries when um, companies uh, use the genetic uh, resources uh, for their products? Um, are there any other negative consequences, in your opinion? Well, yes, of course. The genes of this potato that originally comes from Mexico and Argentina, who are wild relatives of those different regions, have been used, um, I imagine, without um, uh, free and prior informed consent between the different countries and without any open agreement about uh, how to proceed with this issue. This, of course, has an impact on the 
implementation of the most important pillar of uh, the uh, um, CBD, which is the agreement on benefit sharing. And I do think that uh, in these times that we are experiencing right now during the pandemic, where we have to not only face the virus, but uh, a food crisis, that this problem should be in the center of attention and should be focused on how we can establish and maintain the food sovereignty of the most vulnerable groups and uh, the the states and uh, governments have this obligation instead of uh, relaxing the legislation in order to permit that our biological resources can be taken advantage of. I think we should exert a higher control and uh, to really strengthen the work of the indigenous peoples in order to maintain biodiversity. One last question. But those who are using the genetic resources, they are saying that they are doing it exactly for this target. They want to have a potato with better characteristics in order to give um, uh, the population a better quality potato for foodstuff. Well, this is just a mere fantasy. If we uh, were to um, compare the nutritional values of the traditional crops uh, compared to, to the GM crops or other crops that have been produced uh, uh, with the uh, um, modern improvement, uh, those are the modern crops that have uh, oh, supposedly a better or an improved uh, nutritional value in order to improve uh, our defenses, well, our immunitary system when we look at uh, those uh, health issues. But uh, we simply have to leave uh, the evolutionary processes, bring about new generations, new genetic generations who can respond to the different uh, problems. Um, um, I'm not only talking about the, the, the food problems, but about the climate crisis. And I think we have to leave the nature be and uh, to look uh, exactly what the smallholders are doing, the indigenous peoples, they are maintaining the biodiversity on the ground and they really permit um, the nature to establish this diversity and the possibility to create new responses to the problems that we're facing. Many thanks uh, to you, Alejandro, and uh, we will um, certainly continue this conversation, but here I would like to uh, include uh, Hartmut Meyer, project head of the German uh, Society for International Cooperation. It's an agency that uh, mainly Fox uh, works for other uh, for government ministries and um, Hartmut Meyer has been working for many years on the question on how to um, have an equitable distribution of profits uh, from genetic resources. Mr. Meyer, maybe you can tell us first of all what exactly your program is doing. But before we get started, I would like to um, show the results of the survey. Here you go. Um, here you can see who has uh, participated and what uh, their interest is in the topic. We leave it here for those who are interested. And now, Mr. Meyer, I would like to answer, your, um, answer my question. So what are you doing for the BNZ? Are you there? Okay, yes. Oh, I hope you can hear me. Thank you for your invitation and for an opportunity to participate in this interesting conversation at GIZ. I'm participating in the ABS Development Capacity Initiative 
That's a global project, as we call it. We are focused on Africa, but we're also working in the Caribbean and in the Pacific region, and we are working on different levels. We are dealing with the implementing implementation of uh, protocols and other rules and regulations. We are closely cooperating with African nations when it comes to ABS contracts and laws. For example, when it comes to the use of DSI for universities and schools, but we also closely cooperating with local communities and indigenous peoples. In other words, we are trying to truly focus on all aspects and all dimensions of the Nagoya Protocol. But for many years, we've also collaborated with the Commission of the African Union, and we are hosting workshops and trainings for the employees of the Union, but also for the civil society and the private sector dealing with biological products. Now, right now, we are also doing lots of webinars, of course. And we are also quite active on the international level. Thus, we will offer DSI webinars together with the CBD Secretariat. We've sent the first invitations already. So we try to cover the whole range from the international level up to the local one. Now you are collaborating with African nations and other developing countries. You say meaning, support. Do you support these countries so that they are capacitated, so to speak, and know better how to use these complex things? Or what do you do in detail, I wonder? Now, right now, we are in Côte d'Ivoire, where we are helping with the wording and implementation of an ABS law, which implies the access to resources and also identifies criteria for contracts in Kenya, which is also one of our partner countries. We're supporting concrete negotiations, contract negotiations between the country and companies from abroad. And this is about Kenyan plans and these international corporations want to um, examine Kenyan plants in order to use them for perfumes or um, cosmetic products. We also have a biocultural community protocol in several countries. These are documents that bind local communities and indigenous peoples, binds in terms of they are making a list of their local resources and established rules in terms of who must be asked when a certain resource is being used. And we have major conventions or contracts that have come out of these um, documents like the Roibos, um industry agreements concerning what money is to go back to the countries who offer the resources. Well, Roibosch is certainly an excellent example, but there are many fields where you don't have such agreements, right? And there are also conflicts between um, the countries or within the countries between indigenous people and uh, governments. So how would you assess the situation? What do you think about the situation? It's a, a complex one. Indeed, it is a complex one. 
because first of all, you need legislation. In a given country, you need legislation because without a legal framework, it doesn't work. You cannot agree on rules when you don't have any legal regulation. And there are lots of countries in Africa which do not have such laws. And then if they have those laws and want to apply them, you need competences in the field of negotiation. You need negotiating power in order to negotiate contracts. And of course, you all know that an international corporation provides of much more expertise and has much better possibilities than a lawyer, uh, than a small group of local farmers. And even if it comes to African governments, it's problematic because they lack the money. So they do not meet with these international corporations on an equal footing. So here too, we try to offer support in order to get them in a more equal situation. And it is difficult indeed. And especially if you want to get the local people on board or indigenous peoples, you have three negotiating parties, which makes it a bit cumbersome and long. Now we've just heard from Peru that DSI, which is actually part of a regime could undermine global justice and fairness. Would you agree to these fears? Yes, there will certainly be lots of applications where we can do without the genetic resources in order to get the genetic information. Nevertheless, this will certainly be there where breeding plays a role. The potato is clearly an excellent example here. But this will also apply to the virus research and the development of vaccines. I mean, this is what we see right now with the uh, COVID pandemic. In other fields where you need biochemical substances like the products you need for cosmetic products or perfumes, we don't see a major trend towards um, obtaining digital sequence information and yet we do see the problem and it's certainly right to have the CBD focus on this problem. And what about a constructive approach? What do you expect? What could happen? What would be a good solution in order to do justice to both sides? Those who want to carry out research and who rely on open access or an access which is as open as possible and on the other hand, those who have carried out research for thousands of years without it being called research. Well, who knows? Nobody knows what the result of the CBD next COP will be. We do clearly see the complexity of those databases and the complexity of its use. The ABS concept is a quite old one developed in the 1990s, the early 1990s already, and it's based on the assumption that R&D with respect to an organism, a plant, a tree, a coral, for example, gets you new insights, which then helps you generate a product, a new product, which contains the ingredients of the very plant or organism. And this is quite simple because here you can go and make a contract between the government and the corporation involved and the user. But if you look at how the data and databases are being used, and this is being done. And there are several studies and workshops 
which we could organize in a physical form last year, for example, show that a researcher does not download one sequence, but thousands or tens of thousands or whole genomes in order to carry out comparative research or in order to understand the particular substance or sequences you get from your own materials, which you want to compare to what you find in the genome in order to find out what it's all about. So this is not access to one sequence, but it's access to a huge number of sequences. And the traditional model would be a bit different, i.e. user conditions for one sequence. Let's assume you have a sequence from Peru and a similar one from Brazil. Well, the situation is different and the old system, the traditional system we have elaborated doesn't work under the new conditions anymore. And we do begin to realize that we need a new approach, uh, an approach different from the Nagoya protocol, a multilateral system. That's what we are talking about right now, because your traditional bilateral approach, one country and one user won't work anymore. That is to say, you rather expect a kind of fund which is being shared. That's one, 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 one idea, and that's what we also find in the SEEDS contract, right? Indeed. This contract is based on the principle of the country sharing their genetic resources according to this particular contract or convention. And, and the countries need to agree to have the information available to others. And then there is a facilitated access, which is to be made available to all. And then there is also a special extra, uh, sorry, a special benefit sharing fund in to which the countries pay or the users pay. And that's a different approach. It's different from the Nagoya protocol where you have one convention, one contract with one country. Could you tell us a bit about the particular position of the German government in this context? I mean, talking about seeds, is there the German government or are there different um, opinions, uh, depending on whether you ask the, um, the BMZ or other ministries. Well, there is the international contract on SAIDs. And the federal government is a signatory state, but it's also a signatory state of the Nagoya uh, protocol. And the signatories, of course, are binding for all ministries involved, including the Ministry of Justice. But um, the, the, the scientific background and the history are different in this field. Now it comes to um, DSI, the position of the federal government and of the EU, because it's a coordinated approach, says that the genetic information per se is not a subject matter under these conventions. The Biodiversity Convention, but also the SEEDS Convention have almost identical definitions concerning the genetic resources or the genetic material. And the EU says right now that sequence information is not part of the information according to the definition of these conventions and yet at the last COP in Egypt, the German government agreed to talk about DSI and there should be a political and scientific dialogue, they said. So everybody knows that this is an important question. 
My last question, and please be brief in your answer. Could we say that when talking about DSI, we also need to consider that the fronts within the CBD have hardened. People are telling me that the uh, cooperative spirit that used to be part of the CBD cops does not exist anymore because it's about a lot of money. And the same question goes to Edward Hammond, by the way. Well, yes. Lots of contributions. Let me think that the individual parties want to have the money. Now, if you look at the use, you realize that a lot of it won't be commercial, i.e. it's research first and foremost, and yet the debate is difficult because it's extremely difficult to find out how much commercial research there is as far as DSI is concerned. And we don't know what products exist based on this research. So this is what we have to work out first of all. And then you can get an idea of how much money can be made. In other words, we still lack a lot of clarity as far as substantial aspects are concerned. Edward Hammond, the same question goes to you. And another question which comes from the chat, how can you guarantee that the profit sharing money is spent on biodiversity or is used for biodiversity purposes, i.e. for the benefit of those who carried out research and development in the indigenous peoples before. Edward, it floor is yours. I would I would I would love to be able to sit here b before you and say that I that we I could guarantee such a thing, but I think that's a, it this is a um to step back for a moment. I mean the uh the DSI issue is of, is of such great importance and has um, in, a, um, in a relatively classical sort of north-south way gathered, you know, grabbed the attention of the Biodiversity Convention uh, precisely because um, a lot of the issues with respect to physical access to genetic resources, the sort of traditional model um, have been settled and we're in a process of implementation of laws, the development of laws to regulate that access. And we more recently had the realization that DSI really does not fit very well into that, into that traditional model or into, into a national law model for precisely some of the reasons that Hartmut was, was mentioning that um, scientists might utilize a very wide range of sequences uh, in the, you know, that, that uh, wherein uh, coming to an individual benefit sharing arrangement with each and every Initiator of a of a of a sequence or, or owner of a sequence would would be difficult. Um, I think that uh, with respect to how do we guarantee you know that the benefit sharing happens? I mean, first of all, I think that I think that you're, you're you've heard from optimists here today. At, at this point, there is no agreement that there will be benefit sharing. We're we're pushing for it as as hard as we can. And the and the hope is that is that um, is that uh, the scientific community, um, uh, the, the nonprofit, the, the academic scientific community, uh, understands the importance of benefit sharing, and that through governments that that industry is brought around to to agreeing to do it. Now, in terms of structures, I think as as Hartman also mentioned, there's the there's the model of the seed. Uh, treaty, the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, which has a highly elaborated system, but unfortunately has never worked. And, and, and there are parallel efforts there to try to ensure that monies actually go into that benefit sharing fund, which um, really hasn't happened except on a voluntary mm -hmm. basis so far. 
Um, the, the other relevant um, sort of existing multilateral system to, to distribute benefits from use of biodiversity is the pandemic influenza preparedness framework at, at the World Health Organization. Um, and it has raised around 300 million US dollars, which has been dedicated towards, in large measure, towards the uh, fortifying the capabilities of public health laboratories in developing countries. So we have two examples um, that have different aspects that we can draw from, but really at the end of the day, um, it, this is going to be a, a process of creating something new. And for, speaking for myself, at least, the, the, the reasoning that, you know, there's, there's really a moral imperative that we have, I believe, to ensure that, that what, what funding is generated from this, and it should be substantial, um, it may in fact even be something like a tax or a duty on all biodiversity uh, related goods. Um, but we have a real moral duty to ensure that the people that are actually doing the work and that are really, um, that have proven to be effective in conserving biodiversity in the midst of this just incredible crisis, are the beneficiaries and um, no guarantees at this point, but we can try as hard as we can to make that happen. Es gibt noch drei Fragen aus dem Chat. Um, das eine ist There are still three questions from the chat. One is that can the indigenous people simply say no? Could they simply reject what is being negotiated? And somebody wanted to know what kind of sums are we talking about? How much can you earn? How much can you gain? You said at the beginning that Corona and similar pandemics uh, uh, would uh, be a strong driver, but what kind of sums are we talking about? And the third question, would it be also possible to have um, uh, a non-monetary compensation? Um, so if you would alter the distribution, would there be other possibilities uh, to benefit uh, for uh, the people in developing countries? Shall I begin um, with the numbers? Yes, uh, also, uh, I asked Edward Hammond first and then Mr. Meyer briefly. Edward, did you get the questions? With respect to, with respect to saying no, um, there is, there's nothing in um, the debate over DSI that, that would really would, that would create an obligation for uh, existing owners of resources that have not yet been accessed to place the DSI related, the sequence of their plants into the system. So, so the right to say no is in, in my conceptualization of this system would remain. And, and I think that as a matter of sort of morality and law, you, you can't create a system that would oblige, that would force indigenous people and in local communities to, to place their, their, their DSI in this system. But if you created a good one, perhaps they would want to. And uh, I think that's where we should be aiming. Um, the uh, um, sums, I, I would argue, I mean, this is, uh, this is um, we've been through, we've had an experience discussing this in the, in the seed treaty in the last six or eight years where we went from about $400 million to about you know, a quarter of that to about a quarter of that again. And finally, at the end of the negotiation, when everything broke down, industry was offering maybe a million dollars a year, which was, uh, which was really a joke. And it's one of the reasons why the negotiation failed. Um, I think that, uh, I think that the, the solution should be scaled to the problem. And the problem is tremendous. And um, in the future, the, the, it is clear that DSI will be a major source of, of, of products and that we should, we should scale it so that we are doing something substantial to address the biodiversity loss problem. And again, it would be my suggestion and conviction that it should prioritize IPLCs, the indigenous people in local communities. Um, 
on non-monetary benefit sharing, I mean, if, if, if the demand arises from the providers, if there are specific things that, that resource providers are interested in that want in terms of benefit, non-monetary benefit sharing, that could certainly make sense and be part of it. Um, uh, just we need to avoid the pitfall of, of um, beginning to define anything and everything that, that, that scientists or companies do in the regular course of business as being somehow benefit sharing, which is the tendency of, of what, how those discussions go. I think that if there is non-monetary benefit sharing, it should be at the re should considered request of and responding to articulated needs from the, the recipients. Yeah, that sets for us that they are able articulate, Herr Mayer. Well, that provides that they can have a voice, Mr. Mayer. Uh, what about the industry? Who is the industry? Do they speak with one voice? Pharma companies, uh, seed uh, companies. Maybe you can talk about it. Well, that all depends uh, on which level we are facing industry. Um, if I think about our work in the countries, well, the interests there are very different on an individual level. Um, it's different, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, agreeing a contract with, uh, you know, then the interest of pharma or cosmetic industries are very different. And we can see... Um, and I think that these two questions, the monetary and non-monetary profit sharing, um, we can see that the majority of all institutions who uh, uh, are doing research on uh, genetic resources from developing countries, the large majority is coming from universities and public uh, resources so therefore a large part is non-monetary so there are research corporations corporations being offered for example in germany and uh, that's a large part of the benefit sharing at the moment uh, and um, money flows only then when you enter and conclude companies, uh, contracts with companies. And uh, there are not that many contracts. And uh, so in the Roybos agreement that we uh, mentioned with uh, South Africa, well, if it is being implemented, it should uh, generate several hundred uh, million dollars per year. And who benefits from it exactly, the population or the state? Well, it's also going, uh, well, the state is uh, participating, uh, but a large part of is going to the seed council. Um, it's a council of the indigenous people in South Africa who have traditional knowledge uh, about uh, the crop. And there is no overview of this money because a lot of these contracts are not public. They are private contracts, and that's a big problem we are facing because we can hardly describe or define what is actually happening. Many thanks, Mr. Meyer. That was also the request or demand of Alejandro. We need transparency. I have two questions to him from the chat, Alejandro. One question is uh, whether you um, would um, would accept uh, an, a multilateral fund. So bilateral agreement is one thing. And then the other question is, would it be possible to have uh, um, the potato types that are resistance, um, can you, could you not simply pass on uh, to the African farmers or is that technically not possible? That's something um, is being asked from the chat. You have the floor, Alejandro. 
Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, um, to your first question, I think this has to do with the governance of the biodiversity that goes beyond the Nagoya Protocol and the international agreements. I think this should involve um, the International Organization for um, Intellectual Property, where we talk about biotechnology, uh, traditional knowledge, and so on. And uh, by doing that, we should not only include those, but as well the World Health Organization. And then, particularly, the permanent firm of uh, the United Nations of the Indigenous Peoples, who manage the Universal Declaration of the United Nations of the rights of the indigenous people. Only by doing that, we can guarantee that uh, there is an expression of the uh, human rights in uh, um, collaboration with the yeah, rights of the indigenous peoples. This is a very complex issue. And in order to resolve this issue, we have to go on a higher level and to have a more integral approach. Um, and uh, what we could establish, if there was a for it in order to establish the resolution, then we should involve uh, the cosmovision of uh, the indigenous peoples. They don't only have monetary interests in their big majority. They want to preserve the health of Mother Earth and uh, the uh, integrity of the ecosystems in order to have food for all. This is our main preoccupation and not to receive the highest possible benefits. What is the main interest of the companies? Um, so we need this quality. We have to maintain and preserve this vision and not only to look for the cheapest possible price and transfer money to the governments. Uh, and the governments of the majority in my region, they are corrupt. Uh, um, um, La Vallato was only one of the examples, uh, the biggest corruption case we had in the previous years. And um, how about the GM potatoes that uh, can be resistant to the late blight uh, from our potato park? We are sharing potatoes with other communities uh, in the world, but uh, we need a certain degree of adaptation because uh, we have different regional constraints, uh, the regions have different conditions, and we need a very close cooperation between the science and the traditional knowledge. And this cooperation has to be undertaken, conducted with respect. They have to be oriented on uh, the yes, needs yes, of uh, the uh, population. And here in this uh, last point. I think this is something very interesting and very important that we have to include in the discussion all different centers of investigation. Research institutes have to come together, they have to merge uh, in order to promote uh, the uh, build Gates Foundation in Singenta. Now we have uh, 13 different gene banks and what are they using the material for? Is this material privatized? Will this product then be used uh, um, by Bill Gates or Singenta? This, uh, I'm sorry, the connection is interrupted. The systematization of uh, different data what happens to the data once they end up in the gene banks? Are they privatized? What happens to them? And we who have contributed to the big majority of the gene material that can be found in those gene banks, of course, this is very worrying to us to see what happens with this data. Okay, many thanks, Alejandro. Unfortunately, our time is over and um, we would have liked to uh, answer more questions, but it was very clear that it was not possible in 90 minutes. So I hope that we still could show what um, 
these new digital technologies um, comprise of and uh, what uh, such uh, it's not uh, the only area where digitization um, is uh, helping to solve problems but also increasing them and uh, we also found out that the political debates about it are still at the beginning so it hasn't even been clarified uh, what is DSI and, and when is it necessary to have uh, compensation payments and um, all of these things will keep us busy certainly in the next couple of years also on the way to the conference at the end of next year and i hope that we could uh, get things started and you will be involved furthermore and i would like to thank the participants hartwood meyer edward hammond and also alejandro almedo uh, that they for taking the time and I hope that uh, we manage to solve our technical problem with the uh, hands and feet, etc. And I would like to also thank uh, the technicians and the translators in the background that you don't see, but they were quite important. But most of all, I would like to thank you, the listeners that uh, who were an interested interested party to this, and um, many thanks and. Um, also from the organizers and I would like to point out at the end that on the 18th of November we will have the last uh, episode, the last uh, sequence of uh, this event. Uh, it's on nature-based solutions, um, so examples for forestation and emission certificates or CCS uh, underground storage of uh, CO2 um, on how we can uh, uh, tackle the big problems of uh, climate change and biodiversity. Are these solutions possibly, or do they bear new risks? And this is what we want to debate on the 18th. And maybe uh, you are interested in participating. So thank you to all of you and have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.